Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is for us to have the whole Bible in our own language right here before us, to be able to open up its pages and to listen to the glorious and wonderful God-breathed words of eternal life. May we receive their truth with faith and love, lay them up in our hearts and practice them in our lives. We humbly ask in Jesus' name, amen. Please turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. I'm going to read verses 16 through 34, but my sermon this morning will cover only verses 22 through 34. But I'd like to start at verse 16. Acts 17, verses 16 through 34. This is God's word. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he was observing the city full of idols. So he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be present. And also some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers were conversing with him. Some were saying, what would this idle babbler wish to say? Others, he seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, may we know what this new teaching is which you are proclaiming. For you are bringing some strange things to our ears, so we want to know what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the strangers visiting there used to spend their time in nothing other than telling or hearing some new thing. So Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all respects. For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation, that they should seek God, if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and exist, and even as some of your own poets have said, for we also are his children. Being then the children of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and thought of man. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some began to sneer, but others said, we shall hear you again concerning this. So Paul went out of their midst, but some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysius the Areopagite and a woman named Damaris and others with them. May God bless the reading of his infallible word. <clears throat> There's a cave system in Kentucky called Mammoth Cave. And my parents took me and my sister when we were little kids to Mammoth Cave, and it's one of the largest cave systems in North America. And the entrance that we went in was almost 300 feet straight down into the darkness. And it then opens up into a huge room with a, a very high ceiling, and there's cliffs over which you can hear the sound of underground rivers at the bottom of the blackness. And we only saw a very small section of the cave system, but it was still very impressive to go through. And there were all sorts of tours that you could take of Mammoth Cave, some of which required you to squeeze through very tight places wearing special gear and things like that. The tour guide showed us cracks in the ceilings and cracks in the walls that they told us no one had ever seen before, no one had ever gone into them before. And they said that for all they know, most of the cave has still never even been seen by human eyes. And it was a veritable separate world with its own ecosystem, its own strange life forms and everything else. But what was most memorable to me about that experience was when we finally made it to a room filled with benches and the whole tour group was allowed to sit down and rest for a bit. And all the way down into the cave and as we walked through it, there were lights attached to the floors and to the walls so you could see where you were. 
And the tour guide, when we were all sitting down, told us that we're going to experience the meaning of total darkness. The kind of darkness where you can wave your hand in front of your face and perceive nothing whatsoever. And the guide told us that we all needed to sit still and no one was allowed to get up and no one was allowed to talk. And our tour guide's name was Lucille. And she told us that we're going to sit in total darkness and total silence for three minutes. And about two and a half minutes into the total darkness, someone in the group started singing the Kenny Rogers song, You Picked a Fine Time to Leave Me, Lucille. <laughs> <laughs> People were getting a little bit nervous. It's, it's pretty freaky to be in total darkness and silence for three minutes. But I was distracted by something else. I, I had just gotten a very cool digital watch, and it had a tiny little light button on it. And I was really determined to see how bright it would look, because once my eyes had adjusted to the darkness, you still couldn't see anything. You're waving your hand right in front of your face, and your eyes couldn't lock in on anything. And so eventually, I finally, at the end of the three minutes, I held my watch up in front of my face and pushed that little light button, and it was as powerful as a firecracker. It was like a spotlight. It was like the pillar of fire by night when Israel came out of Egypt. And it startled me. Why was that tiny little light that used almost no battery power at all to light up that little watch, why was it so bright? Because of how complete the darkness was in that room. I want to make a point of application. Our country is becoming more and more like that room at the bottom of Mammoth Cave. The theology that dominates the spirit of the age in America is becoming darker and darker. Yet, yet, Christians and the Christian church, we still have a great deal of freedom. We still are able to do what we want. We're able to say the gospel in public, to publish it on the internet. We're still able to live by our consciences. We're still able to gather publicly in our churches, almost entirely free from harassment. My point is this. We used to live in the midst of a culture that was at least familiar with some of the basic doctrines and teaching of, of the faith in Scripture. We used to live in a culture that was biblically literate. For the most part, we don't anymore. We don't anymore. Even in the majority of buildings today, sadly, that wear that five-letter word, C-H-U-R-C-H, six-letter word, excuse me, C-H-U-R-C-H, church, the basic teachings of Scripture are no longer taught, and they're not emphasized. People who regularly witness the people out in the world are saying this more and more. Even churchgoers do not know what the gospel is and don't know the basics of Christian doctrine or what it means to be saved or that they even need to be saved. For years, both in Cincinnati and in here down in the Bible Belt in Tennessee at the Good News Clubs that, that we did, uh, even the church-going children did not know the gospel or the basic doctrines of the Bible. The very first Good News Club I ever did about 10 years ago at Sharonville Elementary School in the suburbs of Cincinnati, there were about 15 kids there that first day. And as I explained the gospel to them and talked about Jesus dying on the cross, I could see that they looked thoroughly confused. And eventually I asked them, raise your hand if you do not know what I mean by the phrase, died on the cross. And 10 out of the 15 hands went up. They didn't even know what crucified meant. And I explained it to them. And I spread my arms out and said, that's how they killed the Son of God. They nailed him to a cross. And the kids were horrified. Little girls were recoiling and putting their hands over their mouths. But what a great opportunity to talk to them about the love of God and the wrath of God. My point is, we live in a time, there has never been a better time to reintroduce the historic Christian faith today. There has never been a better time to be a Christian in this country than right now, because it's so dark that even the tiniest little bit of light is like a firecracker. It's like a spotlight. It's like the pillar of fire that led the people of Israel out of Egypt by night. It was a moving thing to tell those kids about the crucifixion of Jesus, I remember one of those little girls at the end of that first year raised her hand at the, at the very last Good News Club of the year and said, uh, Mr. Hines, are you saying that people actually go to hell? I was like, I've been saying that every Thursday this entire year. I said, yes, they do. That little girl became a Christian. Great, great story. I um, could tell you about her. When the apostles of Christ preached the first Christian sermons ever preached after the Holy Spirit came upon them there in Jerusalem and Jesus had ascended back into heaven, they were preaching to a biblically literate group of people there in Jerusalem. And that's why you see Peter and, and others citing from Deuteronomy, citing from Joel, citing from the Old Testament. They understood their audience. The apostles were expert evangelists. And just to say, 
America used to be like that. America used to be more like the people there in Jerusalem who knew something about the Bible, who knew something about creation, who knew the names of some of Jesus' disciples, who had heard of Moses and Noah and the flood and things like that. For most of America's history, you could cite from Scripture. You could talk about Moses. You could talk about Noah's flood. You could mention Peter and John and Andrew and James, and people would have known who you were talking about. You could talk about Jesus' death on the cross, and people would understand not only what you were referring to by crucifixion, but many of them would have known, at least in principle, yeah, he died for sinners or something like that to bring them forgiveness. Those days are behind us now. Those days are behind us in this country. Even if they did not believe it, they had heard about it or knew something about it, that's not the case anymore. Those days are more and more part of our collective national past. And while the faith is booming, as I mentioned in my pastoral prayer, China, India, South Africa, South Korea, it's not doing as much in the West. It's kind of dying. It's on a downward trajectory. And yet God is doing great things in this country. God is going to do great things in this country. But where we are today as a country and where the Christian church is today as in our country has made it so there has never been a better time to reintroduce the historic Christian faith. With the growing secularization of America, the apostasy of so much of what's left of alleged conservative Bible-believing churches on the LGBT issues, social justice, and all the rest of it, there has never been a better time to use every available means and technology to get the true gospel and the great light of biblical truth explained and summarized so well in our great reform confessions back into the consciousness of our nation. And that's what we need to be doing as a church. It is becoming safe to assume that we are no longer speaking to people like Peter was in Acts chapter 2. Our audience has much more in common with Athens than Jerusalem. The apostles preached the same gospel to all people, but they knew and they understood their audience and their worldviews and their religions too. They were smart and strategic in the way they did evangelism. They were men who understood their times, and we need to be the same. Despite all the pushback that some of the modern groups have gotten, like Answers in Genesis and Creation Ministries International and the Institute for Creation Research, they have done God's people an incredibly useful service in refusing to compromise on Earth's foundational history. That's not just a hobby horse for certain types of fundamentalists or certain reformed denominations. Those things are essential to doing evangelism. If we don't have the foundation right, if we don't have the doctrine of creation and of man and who he is and the, the sovereignty of God, if we don't have those things right, we don't have any context in which we can talk to people about the historical fall, about why the world is the way it is, about why we die, why we get diseases, and why we need to be saved. As we walk through Paul's powerful message here to the Areopagus in Acts 17, I'm convinced that were Paul alive today, after re going through this sermon with a fine-tooth comb this past week, I bet you Paul would be on staff with Answers in Genesis or, or Creation Ministries International. He would hear the other interpretations of Genesis and probably write a letter even worse than Galatians and say, what is wrong with you? Creation is essential. If people don't understand that they are not evolved from African apes, then there's no reason to think that they're connected to the one man that we're all descended from. It's pretty amazing. This, this sermon is, is just brilliant. Light shines more brightly when the darkness is thickest, and you don't want to compromise with the darkness. The darkness simply adds to the relief with which the truth stands out. After speaking in the marketplace with the people who happen to be there, dealing with a little bit of ridicule from the high-powered philosopher types, nothing's changed in 2,000 years, the Epicureans and the Stoic philosophers, Paul was brought to the Areopagus Council because the people there are curious. And they say to him in verse 18, may we know what this new teaching is which you are proclaiming, for you are bringing some strange things to our ears. And before we walk through Paul's message, I wanted uh, to read to you a very brief but insightful comment from William Hendrickson and Simon Kistemacher. Listen to this introduction to Paul's sermon, quote, his speech is both a challenge to pagan religion and a proclamation of the gospel. When Paul addressed the council of the Areopagus, he faced an audience that differed from those in the synagogue worship services. Standing before the Athenian philosophers, he could not assume that they had any knowledge of the scripture or of Jesus who fulfilled the prophecies in scripture. Paul had to begin his speech by teaching his audience the doctrines of God and creation. 
He continued his teaching with the doctrine of man, for man is God's offspring, and he concluded his oration with the doctrines of judgment, repentance, and the resurrection, end quote. And, and Kistemacher and Henderson are exactly right. So let's walk through. I've given you an outline there in your bulletin, Paul's sermon. Point number one, very important point I've called, not brick by brick, but the whole worldview intact. Okay, I'm going to explain what I mean by that. Look at verse 22. So Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all respects. Okay, now stop there. In the verse right before this, we learned that the Athenians and the strangers visiting there, they spent all their time doing nothing other than telling or hearing something new. And they were curious about Paul and what he had to say. And there are many people today who likewise are curious about the Bible and the Christian faith. There are many people, I want to tell you, I really believe this. There are many, many people, multitudes of people in this country who they look at Christian television and they turn on Joel Osteen and they see the odd charismatic silliness of Copeland, Hagen, and Benny Hinn and all the rest of them. And they think in their hearts, there's got to be more to the Bible and the Christian faith than this. They know there is. They just don't know where to go to find out about it. Isn't that sad? I know there's a lot more to it. I just wonder what, what it is. Years ago, myself and a, another minister helped a young man who was attending a home Bible study. He was in his uh, late 20s, had never been to church before, and we sort of tag team led him to Christ, and we studied Romans in this Bible study. And when we got to Romans 9, he said to me and my fellow minister after the Bible study was over, he said, I really, really do not like this. This idea that God is sovereign and rules over everyone and everything, including our eternal destinies. And me and this minister are thinking God is closing in on him for sure, for sure. But then he said, here are his exact words. I have to admit this makes perfect sense and it explains a lot about everything. The unbelievers that you know, work with, live near, and sit by in school and college and other places are likely a lot more curious about you and what you believe than you might think. What we need to know is this, the vast majority of what, if anything, they think they know about the Bible and the faith is completely and entirely wrong. Most of what people think they know about Christianity is wrong. Our hearts need to break for how lost our world is, just as Paul's heart was broken by it. Paul looked at all those temples, those idols, those altars, and his spirit, his soul was provoked within him. Why? Because these were his fellow men. These were his fellow human beings in their sins and under God's just condemnation. And that animated him into action. He loved those people. Even the people that sneered at him and mocked him, he loved them. They had a common plight. They were all sinners in need of salvation. And what these people thought they knew about the world and spiritual things was wrong. It was dead wrong. It was eternally wrong. And Paul is walking around and he knows these people are lost. They're dead in their sins. They're going to go to hell if they die like this. And Paul tells them that he observed that in all respects, in every way that they were religious. It's always amazed me. There's always a handful of commentators who are trying to say Paul's complimenting them here. That he's saying, it's good that y'all are religious. That's not a compliment, folks. Paul is not commending them for their superstition. Some commentators try to say he's trying to show that, look, we, we really have a lot in common, but didn't we just read that Paul's spirit was provoked by all of the idols? In a loving and methodical way, Paul is bringing the entirety of the Christian worldview and system and gospel to bear upon the entirety of their false religious system. Remember, every human being has a worldview. Every single human being has a worldview, a religious outlook on everything that they perceive. The phenomena of creation is interpreted by that worldview and their perception of their own existence, their own origin, their own meaning, what they're supposed to do and what they're not supposed to do is determined by that worldview. Paul understood the worldview of the people he was talking to, the religious commitments of his hearers very well. He perceived their superstitions, and he had read their theologians, their poets, their philosophers. He also perceived that all of those superstitions affected everything. Notice that in the text, in all things. You are, you are religious superstitious in all respects, he says. Paul would not allow the idea 
that one's religious beliefs were simply one aspect among the many aspects of our lives. One's religious worldview affects all things, it says in the text there. The New American Standard translates that adjective normally as all things, as in all respects. In every respect, he tells them, in every facet of your existence, you're religious or superstitious. And there's probably never been a culture more superstitious and religious in the worst possible way than America in 2020. Seriously, you live in the most superstitious nation ever heard of. You see, it's not that people are too skeptical today, it's that they'll believe anything. They'll believe anything. Molecules to man evolution is believed by most, if not by, by most of the people you know, but even by many Christians today. There has been a veritable explosion of occult and diabolical activity in the form of witchcraft, Ouija boards, a fascination with death, zombies, vampires, vampire slayers, exorcists, demon possessions, seances, karma, horoscopes, and everything associated with those practices. When I wrote that sentence, it was just off the top of my head, thinking about the TV shows I had seen since I was a little kid and all the things I've seen out in the world out there. We've seen an explosion of all that kind of stuff. Eastern philosophy, New Ageism, psychic abilities, paganism, reincarnation, horoscopes, and everything else. Look at the popular miniseries that people watch today on TV. People act like one's worldview and one's religious beliefs are in the same category as the color of tie that you wear. It's just a matter of preference. You can pick one today and another tomorrow. It's like the way you pick a hat to wear or what clothes you're gonna wear. And Paul was facing religious relativism and pluralism in the same way that we do today. More often than not, especially when I was in the corporate world, it was extremely difficult to get across to people. I noticed this early on when I was in my early 20s. I was a computer programmer for 11 years before I was a pastor. It was very hard to get across to people at lunch or after work that I wasn't just telling them something that worked for me. People today think religions and worldviews are simply different ways of finding your own happiness. Gone from people's thinking is the idea of absolute truth. Paul's entire message here will have none of that. There's no pluralism. It is all antithesis. It is all, this is what is true over against what you believe that is false. And I want all of you to notice the conviction with which Paul speaks here. It's plain and obvious. He is making universal truth claims which he believes to be true for every single one of his hearers. People in the workplace, at lunch or after work, would so often tell me, I'm glad that works for you. And it took a while. It took a long time for me to realize they actually thought that I was just giving them a personal testimony of what I liked. It was very hard to let people know, I'm saying that this is true not just for me, but for you. For you too. That is something we have to labor to make clear. We're making public truth claims, which are true for everyone in every place always. Now watch how Paul does this. Look at verse 23. For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. Okay, stop there. This is an incredible way to put it to this group. The Athenians were as arrogant as they come. Their civilization had given rise to men who, to this very day, are regarded as being so brilliant that even during the Middle Ages, Christian theologians, brilliant Christian theologians, like Thomas Aquinas, tried to synthesize those Greek philosophies with biblical truth. This was done primarily with the philosophy of Aristotle in the Middle Ages. In the early centuries after Christ, the influence of Plato, the Greek philosopher Plato, is almost incalculable. Even the great Augustine was not able to fully discard some of the unbiblical ideas of Plato. And the early Alexandrian and North Africa theologians, Clement of Alexandria and Origen, they were far more influenced by Plato than they were by Paul. Athens and the civilization it represented, it was the place to be if you were smart. It was the place to be if you wanted to be an intellectual and wanted people to stand in awe of the knowledge that you had. And what's incredible about Paul's message to them is that he, contrary to Clement, Origen, Aquinas, or even Augustine, he does not seek to combine their superstitions or their worldview with the truth of Scripture. It's one thing that jumped off the page in studying church history when I was in seminary. I thought, man, Paul is just letting scripture say what it says. He's not trying to borrow. He's not trying to mix and mingle it. Later, Paul is going to quote from two Greek pagan philosophers, Epimenides of Crete and Aratus. He's going to quote them later to show a couple of their statements 
when they're given a biblical and Christian framework, were not terribly far from the truth. Not terribly far from the truth, but Paul is going to bring the whole Christian system intact with his preaching to his audience. He is not using the brick by brick approach. Now, what do I mean by that? What do I mean by that? There are two approaches uh, so many Christians use today and in the past have used to do evangelism and to try to talk to people about the faith. One is what I would call the brick by brick approach. The other is what I'd call a covenantal or presuppositional approach. And here's the difference. The brick by brick approach tells us that we, we ought to try to get people uh, to Christ one small step at a time until we've built the whole Christian superstructure. In other words, try to convince them first that God exists that a God exists. Then try to convince them that this God is personal. Then try to convince them that the Bible is not necessarily the word of God, but it's, it's unique in the history of the world. Then try to convince them the Bible is generally historically reliable. Then try to convince them that Jesus is unique among the founders of man's religions. Then try to convince them that Christ rose from the dead in real history. Then try to convince them that the Bible's explanation of the cross, the death, and resurrection of Christ is true. Then try to get them to believe that Jesus was the son of God and so on and so on. One little small step, one brick at a time. We're gonna try to build the house and get people one step at a time to Christ. That is not how we're supposed to do evangelism, and that's not how we're supposed to be Christians either. It's a question of ultimate authorities, dear ones. The Christian is sanctified and set apart by the truth. God's word alone is truth. When we evangelize people, we bring the gospel with the entire house already built. All the bricks are already in place. We are not arguing that a God exists. We are never defending the existence and truth of a generic God, but always the biblical God, the biblical Christ, the biblical Holy Spirit. We are never preaching Jesus merely as unique among man's religions, but as the only savior of sinners who rose from the dead after he died in order to conquer death and to truly reconcile repentant, believing sinners to God. And Paul tells this arrogant self-assured Athenian council. These are the elites. These are the high-powered philosophers. These are the people that were looked up to by their fellow Athenians. He told them that what they thought they knew about God and the world was actually ignorance. He says, therefore, what you worship in ignorance, what you do not know, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to proclaim to you. And Paul tells the earthly guardians of the glory and triumph of the human mind that what they are, as a matter of fact, ignorant of. They're ignorant of it. And he's going to proclaim it to them so they can know it. And Paul's boldness is striking and it's powerful to see. Just remember, like David when he faced Goliath, when it comes to the preaching of Christ and the preaching of the Christian world and life view, remember, dear ones, remember this, the battle belongs to the Lord. All you do is represent it accurately. God takes care of the rest. The results are entirely in his hands. We are the messengers of what God has said, the gospel. That is the power of God unto salvation. We don't bring individual bricks of the gospel, but the gospel with all of its foundational beliefs already in place. That's exactly what Paul did with this utterly pagan and biblically ignorant culture that he was preaching to. We have to do the exact same thing. We've got to reintroduce our culture to creation. We have to introduce our culture to the fact that there really are no races in the Darwinian sense, but that there's only the human race, and so on and so forth. Now look at verse 24, next point. Listen to how Paul says this. The God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. Without giving explicit references or citations from the Old Testament, he is virtually quoting Isaiah 42, verse 5 right here to them. Isaiah 42, 5 says, Thus says God the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and its offspring, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. So what does Paul begin with? The God who made the world and everything in it. Since he's Lord of heaven and earth, he does not live in these temples. Pretty bold statement, isn't it? one of the most amazing temple complexes ever built by human hands. He's standing right there in the middle of it. All these temples, the, the Pantheon and all these other buildings, he, God, the one true God does not live here. He doesn't dwell in these temples. And the first and most basic truth the Athenians needed to know was not the same truth that Peter started with in Acts chapter two. 
The audience in Acts chapter 2, those observers of the Feast of Passover in Jerusalem, they already knew the biblical God created the world. They already knew that. They already believed that. But the Athenians didn't. And the first thing humanity needs to get is that God made them. God made the world. God made everything in the world. He is the Lord and master of heaven and earth. He does not dwell in temples made with hands. Even when Solomon built the first temple, he acknowledged that. He acknowledged that in 1 Kings 8, 27. Remember when he prays his long prayer of dedication at the temple? He prayed, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, how much less this house which I have built. And the Greeks really did think their gods lived in those temples and that those pieces of stone and gold and silver were actually the gods. And notice here that Paul is not speaking generically about a God. He's never arguing for generic theism. He is telling them about what the text calls ha theos, the God who made the world. At no point in their ministries do the apostles ever argue for generic theism. They're always and only speaking about the one true and living God when they speak about God. Their doctrine of God comes entirely and only from the scriptures of the Old Testament. Stoics, the people that Paul was speaking to, they were pantheists. And they saw the whole creation as being divine, but they also had little deities everywhere in every respect of the world, but they had no doctrine of creation in their system. The doctrine of creation is vital as a point of contrast to all of man's religious beliefs and superstitions. Very often in man's religions, gods occupy a place in the universe, but the idea that one God and that there is only one God who created all of it and did it all out of nothing by his own power, that is not part of man's religions. Especially among the Greeks, the idea of looking forward to the bodily resurrection, it made no sense to them as they thought the material world was nothing but an imperfect copy of the immaterial realm of ideas that all human beings long to, to rejoin after death. We're created fearfully and wonderfully with significance and glory. The doctrine of creation is an essential truth of the Christian faith. That's why the Westminster Confession has an entire chapter of creation. It's not a sidebar for people that are really into Genesis. It's essential to the Christian faith. We are created by God and wonderfully made with significance and glory. We are created with class. We are created with class. One of the first books I ever read on Reformed biblical theology was Michael Horton's excellent book, Putting Amazing Back into Grace. And the second chapter of that book is titled Created with Class. And he wrote this. When we discuss the fall without having appreciated the majesty of the human creature by virtue of creation, the impression is given that there's something inherent in our humanness that predisposes us to sin, that there is something deeply sinful and unspiritual about being human. This approach presumes the accuracy of Shakespeare's famous words now become cliche, to err is human. But the biblical response would be, to err is the result of human fallenness. You realize that? To err is not human. To err is not human. To err is the result of fallenness. In other words, there's nothing wrong with the manufacturer or his product. The problem is with what his creatures decided to do with the freedom he gave them. So creation is not the problem, and it is only when we more fully appreciate the majesty of humanity as God's creation that we can adequately weigh the horror of the fall, end quote. You see why creation coming from Adam, all being united with him by a covenantal relation that we all fell into sin, you see how that's so essential to evangelizing a pagan culture? Therefore, Paul wants immediately to contest the Stoic pantheism and polytheism in its lack of a doctrine of creation with the truth. The God who made the world and all things in it. Isn't that a great way to start a sermon? That is exactly not what these people believed. The God who made the world and everything in it. Do you see how Paul is bringing the whole Christian system intact? He doesn't say, doesn't it look by all the design that there's a God somewhere? He doesn't do that. He doesn't think that way. He's talking about the biblical God and has all those passages from Genesis as part of his system already. All of its doctrines, its interconnected doctrines, a beautiful tapestry with no pieces separated from the others. The whole superstructure is brought in everything that he's saying. The house is already built and in his thinking and in the way he's presenting it to his audience. Now look at verse 25. 
nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. Now think about this. The purpose of the sacrifices offered in the Old Testament was not to sustain God or nourish him as many of man's religions taught and practice where food offerings would be left for the gods to consume. You have to wonder, did they ever notice that the gods didn't eat anything? (laughs) That all the food just sat there and rotted? Just remember the sacrifices of the Old Testament were not to sustain God. They were to show the worshipers the ugliness of sin. They were to show the people there there is the need for an atoning sacrifice here. And that sin is very, very serious and very costly. Those sacrifices were not to keep God fed, but instead to burn into the consciousness of the worshipers their dire need for an atoning sacrifice to appease God's wrath. The true and living God is the one who sustains us. We do not sustain him or keep him going. He keeps us going. He keeps the Athenians going. He gives people life and breath and all things, clothes to wear, food to eat, a place to sleep, beautiful sunsets to enjoy, rain for their crops and fresh water to drink. Now, I want you to notice something here. The Westminster Divines were brilliant men, and they loved the Word of God, and they got so much right in those great confessions. Question eight of the Shorter Catechism, how does God execute his decrees? He executes his decrees in the works of creation and providence. Look at verse 26. And he made from one man, there you have the doctrine of creation, every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times, providence. Creation and providence, you see it? And the boundaries of their habitation. Paul is biblical in his presentation. He's teaching them about the one creator, that he governs the world by his providence. He determines where people are going to live, and he made them all, creation and providence. Paul is zealous to show the solidarity of the human race as well. It is from one man that God made every nation of mankind that lives on the whole earth. Now, the King James Version, the New King James Version, based on the Texas Receptus here, adds the word blood. It says, from one blood, God made every nation. But the word blood is probably not original, and it really just says one. And you would translate that adjective as one man. From one man, God made every nation of mankind to live on the earth. That is a reference to the historical Adam. Paul would not have entertained for a second the idea that the first Adam is allegorical or that he's not real. He's saying from one man, he made every nation of man that dwells on the earth. We are all related to Adam and we are all related to each other. There is only the human race in this world, human beings who are from the far flung regions of the earth from us and have darker or lighter colored skin are not, they are not the biological descendants of various lines of ape-like hominids. Notice that Paul does not try to combine the biblical doctrine of man's creation with the doctrine of human origins held by any of his hearers. You see that? You see that? All the compromised interpretations of Genesis, all the compromising on was Adam real, was was Eve real, all the compromising on that does nothing but cripple the church and its witness. Paul simply asserts the plain, straightforward, simple meaning of Genesis 1 through 11. God made one man and gave him a wife. From those two came every single one of us and every nation of mankind on all the face of the earth. Isn't that so simple? Isn't that so simple? Why why is that such an important doctrine? Because people need to know that they are not cosmic accidents. You are not a cosmic accident. You are the special creation of God made in his image, made to seek after him, made for communion and fellowship with him. You are the special creation of the one true God. And we are all connected. We all come from one man. Why is that so important to this audience here? The Greeks thought that everyone born outside of Greece was a barbarian. Paul's point following scripture is that we're all related and we're all part of the one grand human family from one man. No matter who we are, where we were born, what we look like, we're all part of the one human family. In the second half of verse 26, Paul also contrasts the biblical truth of God's sovereign design and purpose and decree with the impersonal, purposeless concept of fate held by his hearers. 
Paul was very clearly presenting the Westminster Shorter Catechism's questions and answers. What are the decrees of God? And then how does he execute those decrees? In the works of creation and providence. He realized it is not an accident where you were born, where you grew up, where you live, or where you're sitting right now. God determined all of that. It's not left to impersonal fate. The Roman emperor Marcus Aurelius in the second century, he required all of his legions, his soldiers, to read and study Stoicism because it taught them that there is no purpose to anything that comes to pass. And he found that it made them more willing to die. It made them more stoic in facing death. What does it matter? Nothing has any purpose anyway. Nothing has any design behind it anyway. But you see the Christian doctrine of creation and providence, it's directly challenging that. You realize the people that you talk to and meet that are not Christians, they think the same way. Nothing has any purpose. Nothing means anything. There is no governing providence behind anything. And Paul is telling these Athenians, where you were born and where the barbarians outside here were born was determined by the one God. Everything has purpose and design. I want to tell you, if you're young in your Christian walk, that fact that everything has purpose and design, if it doesn't sustain you now, it will sustain you when the roof caves in. It will sustain you when the floor gets pulled out from under you by God's providence and by difficult times. God's works of providence, they are his most holy, wise, and powerful, preserving and governing all his creatures and all their actions. There is no fate, there is no chance. In fact, the location in which every single human being has ever been born, lived, or died was exactly according to God's determination. And Paul was preaching the biblical God here as the sovereign king and Lord of all. And why? Why did God create man? He tells them in verse 27, you see it? that they would seek God. Okay, now stop there. Not these false statues and, and stone and gold and silver in your temples, but this unknown God that you don't know about. He created you and determined where you would live and in fact orchestrated it so that I would be here today to talk to you so that you would seek him. Look at the rest of the verse. If perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. Yes, as Paul wrote to the Romans, there is none who seeks after God. We know that because of the fall. The fall has made man not able to seek God anymore, but hiding from God. And these very Athenians, by those superstitions, by those false religions and those temples and those statues, they were in those very acts trying to run from God. This is a way of Paul rebuking them for their idolatry. He's saying, God made you and determined where you would live so that you would seek him. But look at what you've done. You don't even know who the true God is, and you have all these temples and false deities all around you. You see how he's rebuking them? The evangelist, the Christian person telling the unbeliever the truth is like the person grabbing Adam and Eve from behind the trees in Eden and trying to pull them out to show them God while they're hiding. And they don't want to come out. They don't want to come to God, and they won't come to God unless his almighty effectual call of regeneration brings them out. Nevertheless, God still commands all men everywhere to seek him with all their heart. That's the will of God, even though the fall has made us incapable of doing that. And notice that Paul tells them this one true God is not far from each one of you. You hear that? That's another contrast to their beliefs that God was transcendent. God, God was not really near us at all. Now look at verse 28. For in him we live and move and exist or have our being as even some of your own poets have said, for we also are his children. Okay, stop there. Paul is here emphasizing to them the personal and individual element of God's relationship to man. God is near to each one of us as individuals. It is because of God that we live and move and have our being and exist. The Stoics believed that God in an impersonal manner was present everywhere. He was everywhere, but not personally. You couldn't relate to him. You couldn't talk to this God. And Paul contrasts that directly with the fact that God is near his people and personally relates to each individual one of them. Psalm 145, verse 18. The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. The Stoics did not have a near God. They didn't have a God that would listen to them, that they could call upon and he's telling them, you live and move and have your being in this God, and he's not far from each one of you. You see the contrast here? He's not trying to find common ground. He's telling them the truth that they're ignorant of. 
Indeed, for the true believer, God's not only near us, he indwells us. He is in us in the most personal way possible. He knows us, and we know him and follow him and obey him and listen to him and pray and worship him. Verse 28 contains the quotations from those two pagan philosophers, Epimenides and Aratus. And listen, Paul is not agreeing with them. He is using their words with Christian and biblical definitions built into them. He's not saying, see how right you all are. He's saying to them that despite their superstition in all respects and in every way, that some of their own poets wrote sentences, which when viewed through the lens of divine revelation that he's been preaching so far are actually correct. When they're corrected biblically, what they said turns out to be true when given the proper definitions. We are all God's offspring and that he is our creator. We are all his children in that narrow sense and that he created us. And Paul now moves directly to application and the call to repentance. Look at verse 29. Being then the children of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and thought of man. Okay, stop there. The Genesis doctrine of creation makes idolatry obvious and sinful. God created the world. God is not matter. God is matter's maker. The divine nature is not made of gold or silver or stone. Here Paul is pointing out what many Christian theologians have said through the centuries. God made man in his own image, and man has been trying to return the favor ever since. God is not an image formed by the art or thought of man. The essence of idolatry is attaching religious significance or giving religious affection to anything in creation or to anything or anyone other than God. And since God created the world and everything in it and he made us, we ought to know he's not made out of gold. He's not made out of silver. He doesn't live in temples like this. He transcends the creation. He's not part of the creation, so don't worship idols, is what he's saying to them. Look at verse 30 and 31. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent, because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Wow, a lot in two verses. Today is the day. Everything changes for the Athenians. While God will hold all people everywhere responsible for their sin, no matter what their access was to the Bible or the gospel or the Christian faith, listen, when the gospel arrives in a dark place, when the little boy pushes the light on his watch in the darkness, the times of ignorance are over. The times of ignorance are over. Through his messengers, God is declaring to all men they must repent of idolatry and sin. They must repent of their conceiving the divine nature to be made of gold or stone or silver or money or sex or politics, cars, power, sports, whatever. Why? Look at verse 31. He tells them why. How loving is this on his part? He has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. He's saying, I'm here to tell you about the God you don't know. You guys are so superstitious, you even had an altar to the, to the God that maybe you missed, the unknown God. Well, I'm telling you about him, and he's the only God there is, and he is not like you think. And you need to repent because he's going to judge the world, including every single one of you. Look at verse 32. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some began to sneer, but others said, we shall hear you again concerning this. And then verse 33 and 34 So Paul went out of their midst, but some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. Okay, I have a question. Was Paul successful as an evangelist here? Yes. We can assume he explained the rest of the gospel as far as how you're justified and everything else, either in his earlier conversations or later. What I mean is this. Was Paul a successful evangelist? Was he successful in evangelism? What is successful evangelism? Please hear me. Successful evangelism is faithfulness to the gospel and to the whole Christian worldview as taught in scripture while preaching it because that's what glorifies God. Remember that the goal of evangelism is the same as the goal of everything else, the glory of God. Listen to me. The purpose of evangelism is not to save souls. Purpose of evangelism is not to save souls. It's to glorify God. If God saves people, that's his prerogative. The salvation of souls, that's God's part. Yes, that glorifies his grace as well, but our purpose is the glory of God. First, faithfulness to the text of scripture, 
to the Bible, to the gospel. Our part is to get the gospel right, to preach it accurately in the context of believing the whole Bible beginning from the very first verse to the very last and to present God accurately in our demeanor, our love, our patience, our delivery, and by the whole life that we live. The results belong to God. The battle belongs to the Lord. Now in conclusion, our country was once a place of tremendous gospel light, but it's not today. It's becoming more and more rare to hear the true gospel anymore. It's like we're all sitting in the bottom of Mammoth Cave in total darkness. There's never been a better time to reintroduce the biblical gospel and the Christian world and life view beginning at Genesis 1-1 and ending at Revelation 22-21 and upholding everything in between. The time for compromise is never. That light will only be as bright as God's people are faithful to it. The light will only be as bright as we are faithful to it. Why be impressed with a tiny light from a cheap digital watch when we have the greatest blazing and bright torch imaginable in the gospel? Let's shine it once more. The darkness only makes it that much brighter. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we bless your name for the biblical gospel, for the savior that you sent, and that you've given us the entirety of the truth in scripture. May we be faithful to every part of that divine revelation as we live our Christian lives, as we disciple our families, as we love one another, as we stir one another on to love and good works, but especially as we talk to unbelievers. May we bring the whole Christian faith, all of its parts, so that we can shine that light in this dark place. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.